Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Wealth Within Us. Today, I have my friend Caitlin Bird with me, and she is a service dog trainer slash coach, but she trains service dogs for people that need them, which we all do. And whether we believe it or not, I think my dogs, I've made her an emotional support dog. So, <laughs> but I think all dogs and animals can be our emotional support friends. But thank you so much, Caitlin, for taking the time out to join me. I know we're going to have some fun stuff to talk about here and just tell everybody what your journey was to get to where you are. Cause I know you didn't start out as a service dog trainer. Right, Michelle, that is absolutely true. Now, before I get started in that, I just wanted to clarify the difference between an emotional support animal and a service mm -hmm. dog, because while Perfect. you're correct, any animal can be an emotional support animal, which is when you were having all of these um, news articles with somebody having a peacock on their shoulder in an airplane, <laughs> you know, that, and that can be a legitimate emotional support animal. But because there was this abuse of that system, the DOT, a couple of years ago now has actually restricted uh, emotional support animals and have treated them now as pets on flights. Um, so you do actually have to uh, pay a fee to have your dog fly and typically in cargo at this point, if you're an emotional support animal or under your seat. So um, a service dog is actually an animal that takes one to two years to fully train to help assist somebody who has a disability in their life. Mm -hmm. And the way that I kind of got into this, this field is, you know, I was that young girl growing up and I never really grew out of the, I love animal phase. I kind of double down. <laughs> yeah. I love more animals. <laughs> yeah. I love animals and I will continue to love them. Um, so, you know, when I was growing up, I was, um, I was, I didn't grow up in the healthiest of households, right? So I was kind of undiagnosed with ADHD um, and PTSD later on in life mm -hmm. from some situations with my, my parents. And, um, you know, once I, once I started getting the help that I need, I have actually seen a ch huge change and shift in um, my business and, and just the ability of the things that I'm able to do now, because, um, well, yeah, because mindset is everything. And all of those things that you were talking about, they're almost like roads, like roadblocks on our path. Right. Because if you grow up in an unhealthy household, there's a lot of, oh, what's the word? Like they teach you how to speak to yourself internally right? If people are putting you down, you learn to internalize that and to use yeah. that. It's like, time. it's like you're being programmed, especially we always is say that's the word like, from zero to seven is our most programmable state because we're new. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what it is. They're programming you. Um, and in some ways they're also, um, setting you up to continue that cycle mm -hmm in your adult life. And that's how we actually yeah. end up your different partners. And uh, we can end up repeating a cycle that's not yeah. healthy for us because that's all that we know. And yeah. everything else is doesn't feel comfortable to us. Um, and it is interesting because a lot of times we know it's not healthy, but yet, like you just said, it's all we know. So it's what we keep doing. Yes. Yes. Because new things are scary. They are. And especially new, th new things that negate the things that you've been taught or the way that you've lived your life up until that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I remember in my previous relationship, which I recently left for the better is, you know, while that relationship wasn't as bad as the place that I grew up in, it took me about two years of quality therapy with somebody who specializes in narcissistic, abusive, physical or verbal, you know, abusive yes. relationships to help me realize, you know what, this person is not wanting to move forward with me. He doesn't value my opinions as a person. He doesn't value me as a person. And he just, the, they just didn't care. Right. Yeah. So and, and I think the, the biggest part of that struggle or the, the most beneficial is when we realize it, yes. we may not be able to clearly identify it is but we know enough to know that whatever's going on is not how it should be there's something wrong here and just that awareness alone is the first step 
Awareness is the first step. However, the transition is the most uncomfortable and scary part. Yes, yes. Because uh, it's like you just want to run back to the old thing. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, but at that point, I was fully committed. I was like, you know what? It's been four and a half years in this relationship. Yeah, like I'm done. <laughs> and I could see like we, like he he didn't want to grow. Yeah. He wasn't new ideas. He was stagnant. He was stale. Like it wasn't, it wasn't helpful in any way. And at any time I tried to, you know, grow together as a person, it was immediately shut down. Yeah. So it took that a long time. And that halts your own growth. So. And that halts my own growth. But I am now dating again, which I'm super excited about. Um, (laughs) And I see the world with, with, it's, the world is so different when you finally know what you're looking for in a person and the characteristics and what the red flags are for you. That is so true. Cause I've been single for a long time now. And yeah, I do. I look at people differently and sometimes like in a judgy way, I'm not even going to lie about it. <laughs> like, yeah. Like you're like, ew, I would never be with that. Or I would never accept that. And I know like that's not the best way to handle maybe those things, but I do. And I think, yeah, that would be a flag for me or yeah, that would be a flag for me or no, nah, that's not for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm still <laughs> single. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, um, I guess I guess I never really answered your question. Oh yeah, we kind of did dive off into the side thing. So yeah, so back to animals. So back, back to, to animals, animals, right? So I got hyper focused again. I was undiagnosed with ADHD at the time, um, and I was homeschooled and stuck with these, you know, shitty this shitty living environment. With my parents, <laughs> and so I kind of went into my own world of like hyper focusing on behavior and behavior change with animals. Hmm. And Did at the time pets growing up, um, I was very restricted on the pets. I was, I remember though, how I got my first pet hmm. and it was a little parakeet named Polly. And <laughs> I had her for about eight years. And the way that I got Polly was after bugging my parents, like every day for a week, they got annoyed with me. They're like, okay, fine. Like if you can show responsibility, if you can clean your room every single day for a year We'll let you go to the pet shop and pick out any pet you want. Now, I guarantee you, it was not a year that I did this. It was probably a solid three months. Okay. (laughs) And they're like, okay, we'll prove you were worth um, that uh, taking care. You know, you have responsibleness. Uh Uh-huh. And I think that's where I started getting some of my my cleaning habits from, was just from like that early (laughs) part of life. You want a pet? Okay, clean. So I did, and I went to the pet store, and I had my heart set on a rabbit, but then I started thinking about it, I was like, well, they're kind of boring, they don't do a lot, and I saw the the area with the parakeets, and they were just so much more active, and they were doing things, and they were brightly colored, right, and kids like yeah. different things, so I got... Um, I got a parakeet or a budgerigar for, you know, the, the proper bird people out there, Um and from there, you know, my obsession kind of grew. I ended up volunteering for a bird rescue, working with some oh. of their behavior cases there. I got really into behavior, like I said, and I started going to conferences to learn more about behavior from the people who were actually like in zoos, working with mm. these exotic animals or doing bird shows over at um, Disney's Animal Kingdom, right? So there were all these experts that um, I started seeing on stage. They were all kind of, you know, they have these giant egos and they want to show off and like try to one up the next person to see, you know, show what they worked on during the year. So, and they really showed how they troubleshooted working with some of these species that maybe had never been worked with or trained before. Oh, and it really helps you think outside the box and see how they overcome specific challenges during the year when they were working with these animals and what they tried, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and it got a lot of good talk about, you know, how behavior works and motivation and all these other things. So that's really where I got my start was, you know, I have six, five or six years of early on in my life when I was um in high school and early college going to these yearly or twice yearly um symposiums and workshops 
and getting to really practice my skills and my understanding as a trainer. So that's where it kind of started. And then as time went on, I graduated with my degree in animal biology from University of South Florida. I did an internship with Natural Encounters, who also does the um, the bird shows out of Disney, as well as several other places throughout the U.S. and sometimes internationally. They okay. help consult with other like bird shows and educational shows. Um, and then after that internship was winding up, I got a job offer up in Pennsylvania for one of the local zoos. Now, of course, if anybody knows, if you guys know anything about working in zoos, they don't really pay a lot. Mm. <laughs> I did get to work with, with uh, across the different species. So like both mammals and birds of prey and the aquatics and the amphibians and all that stuff. Um, so all the animals. All the animals, yes. For yes. not yes. a lot of pay. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but, you know, when you're on a zoo budget, um, you know, yeah. if your car breaks down, you can't afford to repair it, right? You're kind of just, if a major accident happens, mm -hmm. you can't really afford anywhere else to go. You're, you're literally le like living hand to mouth. Um, so um, I eventually started up my own dog training business. And as the years went on, I, there's this one woman who reached out to me and me being, you know, a, 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 a loving the animals as well as the training aspect of it. I really loved behaviors that you could teach animals that had real world application. Mm. And when you're in a zoo environment, the majority of the behaviors you train is things like voluntary, um, injections and blood draws Making okay sure the animal voluntarily comes up and down off of a scale shifting in and out of their enclosures right so it's almost we uh, it almost sounds like it's all surrounding their care and their environment that they've been placed in absolutely maybe how to deal with it almost absolutely not only deal with it but to huh. be willing and voluntary participants that are okay happy to form a loose relationship with you because they're wild animals, right? They're not, yes. unlike dogs who are bred to work with us for thousands and thousands of years, yeah. these animals really don't care. No. More or less. Not. not concerned about you. Right. And they can be very dangerous, especially a prey, a large prey species like a scimitar horned oryx. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> they have very long like hold off your tongue. <laughs> um, if they just turn their heads to run away from you, like you're gonna get stabbed with that thing. Oh and they wow. can be very flighty for prey species, and you have to be very careful with each step you move, each step you take. And even then, that's no guarantee that they're not gonna startle because you know the environment is not necessarily under your control all the time either. Yeah. There's a noise that happened. Maybe there was something that moved quickly. Yeah, some, something maybe. dropped. Somebody right. screamed. Right. So a lot of the work that we do is is behind um, um, fences and gates. And there's always some sort of barrier between yeah, us. Some kind of safety. Of, yeah. Absolutely. Safety measure. So anyways, I started my own dog training business. And then as the years went on, there was this woman who approached me and she, she had a dog that was already partially trained as a service dog. There were some things that she was struggling with, but overall, when she came to me, I was impressed. I was like, oh, wow, this dog is able to perform well. You guys seem to know a lot of what, what you're doing. Um, and I was able to further provide her a lot of value with not just the hows and whys behavior happen, but also to coach her through and to think for herself and troubleshoot the issues she was going through. So almost like a train the trainer type thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and eventually the service dogs end up with, you know, their owner, the person that they're doing the service for. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And in the US, you can train your own service dog, but um, the majority of people that. that, yeah, yeah, you can. There is no actual certification, but your dog should be 
performing well and being mm -hmm. super well behaved in public, like not sniffing things, not trying to go say hello to people, not no. sitting in a grocery cart, for instance, right? That kind of thing. Um, oh, you just described my dog. <laughs> all those things? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> She, yeah, the dog like, needs to be able to pay like attention. A little she's human at all times. You pay attention. Be focused at all yes, times. Yes, yeah, and um, and she's good. I have I do put her in the grocery cart, especially at I I love taking her to T, like TJ Maxx and Marshalls. Yeah, and there's some places that cart, allow it, and yeah, and they allow it. And she's funny. She'll just sit there and look around. It's almost like sometimes you forget she's there because she's just so interested in everything else, and she just sits there. It's very she rare. Takes it all in. <laughs> yeah, just takes it all in. You know what? I think she just likes being with us. Like she doesn't like being alone. So she yeah. just likes the company. Like, oh, you're going to the, the store? Take me. You know, like a little kid. Can I go? Yeah. Can I go? <laughs> of course. Of course. It's line, better than a little kid because we're not crying for the candy bar at the end of the line. So <laughs> yes, yes. And they're not expensive. I just maybe buy her like a five dollar bag of treats or something. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> And I'm sure she's a little dog. So those, those are going to last forever. Right? Yes, they do. She's a little dog. <laughs> awesome. But not a service dog. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Not a service dog. And it, there, there is, there's a lot of confusion about emotional support animals too, mm -hmm. which they're not allowed in stores that dogs are not allowed in. Again, they are just pets because any animal can provide emotional support. That's not yeah. something that you train. As the years went on, I worked with this woman. I started taking on other clients and I decided, you know what? The service dog thing is really cool. Um, I These clients are somebody that I typically work with long-term. We build a relationship with the person mm -hmm. and the dog. And I was like, this is awesome. So I decided about four years ago to start niching down into service dog work. And, you know, there, that wasn't without its growing pains. I did a lot of, <laughs> I, I took some pretty awful clients in the beginning and uh, <laughs> probably some that I should have said no to, um, which is but, hard when you're starting out, I will admit. Yeah, that's true. It, it is hard when you're starting out. Um, but it's, but it's also knowing the signs of, of, you know, who, when, when to turn away people, right? Yeah, and when yeah. to move forward with people. And you, uh, by default, you learn that by taking on those people. You know what I mean? So it's you like, can. You, know, you definitely learn can that. Do but, but I have to say, uh, after hiring my assessor, mm, she's a that's right. Assessor, told me about yep, that. And she has made my life so much easier. Yeah. And she's, she's taught me so much more quickly what makes a good client a good client that yeah. I could have, you know, then trying to learn from scratch. Exactly. And the the whole point of hiring you for your services is to have success. You know, when you're hiring for someone with a service dog, because of the amount of time that it takes to train them, you don't want to take on dogs or clients that you don't feel that you can help. Correct. Because if you're a person with a disability mm -hmm. and you have a dog that is supposed to help you, the dog is supposed to help you not yeah. make the process more difficult or anxiety producing or, you know, making your disability more difficult to work with. Yeah. That's not what a service dog is for. Mm -hmm. And I was finding a lot of dogs that were not the right fit were, were doing that to the clients. Hmm. And again, I'm going to plug my assessor here. If it wasn't for her to help me out with this process, you know, I wouldn't, um, I don't think I would be half of what I'm doing today. Uh, it's the assessment's been so good. I'm I'm pursuing the certification myself. myself mm, for myself. the assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And already, like I've learned so much um, and I'm kind of, you know, we're, we're often now on the same page these days about, hey, what do you think about this dog and that person? Mm -hmm. I'm like, X, Y, Z. And she's like, yeah, X, Y, Z. <laughs> yeah. So you really are learning a lot. And I mean, 
you're doing whatever that client is or potential client a favor. Even if you have to turn them down, it's like they may not see it, but you're still doing them a favor. Because I would imagine that you're really training two people. You're training the dog and then the owner, you know, the person that is going to be dependent on this dog for whatever their disability is. Yeah, we're, we're training two separate parties. Absolutely, we're training yeah. two separate parties. One's the dog, one's the person. And yeah. because training a service dog, I'm saving that person time, energy, and money. Yeah. You know, yeah, and I'm sure that if that like, like if the person didn't, go ahead. Oh yeah, there's people out there who struggle with other trainers who were in the exact same boat I was four years ago, just kind of taking everyone on willy nilly. And they are... Either they are uh, resorting to more punitive tools to try to get the dog to fit into this mold that they're not fitting in, or they are just really nervous and find training very difficult and the dog isn't, is just isn't fitting in well. And my goal as the trainer, as your coach is to make sure that it's a pleasant experience, experience as possible and as smooth of a transition as possible. Um, Typically in order to make that happen, you know, I have these days I have puppy prep, which is before you even get your dog, come to me, let's get you on the right skill set and get your house in order and get your expectations right. And then, you know, practice with my dog or other dogs that I have here to train with, make sure your skills are where they're supposed to be and get you to just kind of understand and know the concepts yeah. of how things work. And that's, that's four months of work alone. From there, the dog's typically bored with me. So what is that doing? The people get to come over once a week. They get to see the daily videos that I'm uploading Monday through Friday. And they're seeing the work that's going into these puppies to get them to a place, make sure they're not jumping on counters, make sure they're not raiding the garbage bin, make sure they are getting potty trained well and quickly and doing good and proper crate introductions and that they are enjoying the car rides, right? So there's all this other work that lays the foundation to make sure that it is a smoother transition so that they do understand what's going on so that they see that transparency so that they get that weekly practice with their puppy, try it out over the weekend, troubleshoot some things, let me know what's going on. And then we adjust from there to make sure it stays smooth, right? Yeah. And that's really what it is. These days, it's more of an experience to make sure that everything, you know, we're dotting our T's or dotting our I's and crossing our T's, you know? Yeah, because it is an ongoing thing. You can't just take a service dog and expect the dog to just always do the things that it's supposed to do. I'm sure it's constant reinforcement. And I'm sure if you let it go, I would assume that the puppy can regress a little bit or, you know, for lack of doing what it was trained to do. You know, that's a great point that you bring up because the answer is yes and no. In the Mm. beginning stages of training, there's a lot of reinforcement, constant, Mm -hmm. constant, constant, constant. As the dog is growing through this process over the one to two years that it takes, you have to know where you're at in the training process because the the dogs start picking up things and it just starts to become a habit. Mm. So are you still using reinforcement? Yes, but it's becoming less and less over time as the dog is just bonding with you more, understanding what is expected of them, getting what to do. Right, absolutely. And then, you know, you can get to the point where where being with you and working is self-reinforcing. Um, but I find a lot of clients do still like to give their dog treats and reinforcers because that in and of itself is a bonding experience. It is. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Good. Cause I like to give my dog treats. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. do Food too. makes experiences so much better, right? That's why we go to family uh, gatherings and Christmas, right? Yeah, and picnics kind of and together. all those things. Yeah. Absolutely. It is, it, And it is so interesting how the psychology of the animal overlaps with the psychology of people. Oh my gosh, yes. So we take all this stuff from child psychology in many forms. Um, And child psychology is, you know, also derived from human psychology. So um, yeah, there's a lot of overlap. I tell people, you know, I get, I'm always excited 
when I get a client in who is either a teacher or Mm -hmm. works with special ed, because they're going to really understand the concepts and just shoot off to the moon. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They're going to fly through your program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you look for? Do you mostly work with puppies or can any dog at any age become a service dog or what's any dog at any yes yeah so any breed at any age can become a service dog there's some things that you have to take into consideration because it does typically take one to two years to fully train your dog so if you have like a five-year-old great dane that's not you know they they live seven eight years maybe yeah so they're not going to have much time Exactly. So you need to take that into consideration with the health and the working life of your animal is going to be after the training process. At that point, it might, it would be better to either find a dog that's already around a year or two of age, or you could even start again from a puppy. So it really depends what you're looking for, what that time frame is. Right now, I'm currently looking for two puppies and one older dog that's around a year or two of age. Okay. Um, that would be good candidates for service work. And this is all just dependent on what my clients have as their needs. Yeah. And that that's determined in the application process. So. And it's, it, and is it determined as to which dog would better suit their needs? Like which breed? Well, of- what? what do you mean? Well, I don't know. Like say you had someone that was in a wheelchair. Is there a better dog for that than another? Like a better dog? Oh, I see. Yes. So the tasks that you are going to be teaching the dog totally depends. So you're right. So somebody who needs, maybe they do need a dog that can help them in and out of their wheelchair where that is what we call a mobility assistance dog. Okay. And with mobility assistance dogs, there's several specialties about this that you want to make sure are done before you even begin mobility work. Number one is have the dog's growth plates closed. Oh, right. (laughs) Because we want to make sure that the dog is, we're not putting pressure on these joints and squish. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. If they're not finished growing. Yeah. So exactly. what, so that maybe that dog needs to be a year old or so. Exactly. Yeah. Especially before you start doing any of those tasking things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause you um, could probably almost injure the dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, the big thing too, about mobility dogs is I don't suggest anyone get a rescue for a mobility mm-hmm. assistance dog, especially if it's heavy mobility because the dog's health we, is unknown. Mm-hmm. And God forbid you put in all this effort, time, money, and energy into this dog and as your mobility dog and oops, sorry, he, he's got joint issues. He's got elbow problems, elbow, he's got bad hips. He's got back problems. Like it could be a myriad of things. And we just don't want to take that risk when it is going to be a mobility dog. That makes sense. Right. There's a lot of things that take in to uh, consideration. Well, and that's why your assessment is so important. Yeah. So the behavior assessment is a little different than like the physical assessment, right? Because that's, you can't really just, you can't necessarily tell, um, especially if you're getting like a puppy rescue. Yeah. That's, that's that's risky. Um, But the personality assessments that my assessor does is is really helpful um depending what the person is looking for yeah so for example the last two puppies that I got that were assessed um were actually also picked additionally because we do consider personality traits of what people like in their dogs because that also helps accelerate the bonding process yeah And everybody, anybody's going to fall in love with a puppy. Like (laughs) you can't not fall in love with a puppy. I know. So we get, we get the, you know, we get the baseline. So one of my clients more recently, she got a puppy. um, His name was Ajax and he's a standard poodle. And like, I know that my client was more touchy feely. She liked her dogs to be more close to her. Mm -hmm. So I found that dog during the assessment. I was like, this is a perfect fit. You guys are going to love each other, even though he was only a puppy of like 10 weeks of age. 
Um, and then my other client, we actually got two puppies from this litter. She has Vinton and he is also a standard poodle. Both puppies are black and she has already had her own successful service dog in the past. Oh, and this dog was just, I mean, I would describe him in my view for what I look for in my own personal dog is a 10 out of 10. <laughs> hmm. Uh, very operant, able to pick things up quickly with training, super confident in the environment, um, independent enough, but not overly clingy because she wasn't looking for a clingy dog. And I'm like, well, perfect. This is yeah. the absolute perfect fit. And, you know, sometimes you have to walk away from a litter assessment because we we assessed, I think, nine total puppies that day. Wow. Sometimes there just isn't a right fit in a litter. And you have to take that into account too, mm. because you have to be prepared to walk away. Yeah. And know that this may not be the one. Yeah, but it must be a little disappointing to walk away from a litter because, I mean, how many litters do you get the opportunity to assess? It's not disappointing because what would be more disappointing is if I chose... Yeah. Or if we chose the wrong dog for the client. That's such a good way to look at it. Yeah. We want to make sure it's the right dog who's going to enjoy the work and fit really well in with the person as well. Well, and it's funny, like how you're talking about some of this stuff, because I even look at I my dog's a rescue. And even when I was choosing her at the time, I was living in a pretty large apartment building. There were a lot of people with dogs. It was an elevator. And I was looking for maybe even not necessarily a puppy, but I think I would have. But I was like, well, this dog needs to get along with other animals because it's going to be interacting with them, whether it likes it or not. And it has to like people. And there were just like certain things. And I wanted a smaller dog. But just knowing my own lifestyle that maybe sometimes people don't think about when they go and find a dog. And I mean, honestly, I got the most perfect dog, I think, for me. <laughs> but those were criteria that I had in mind because of where I was living, because of my lifestyle. Like I travel and go around a lot. So I wanted a dog that, you know, would be good in the car and all these other little tiny things. But that up, that added up to such a joyful experience that I have with her. You know, had I have gotten like, I mean, I remember people in that building with like pits and pit mixes that they just couldn't handle and the dog was dragging them around. And then, you know, sometimes you'd open up the elevator and you wouldn't know what would happen. I got this little small dog here. And, you know, so it was kind of at least from my perspective, I knew what I wanted to look for. And especially considering the environment that I was in. Absolutely. I mean, and you always have to be careful with people who are handling their dog. Like I can tell you just walk, watching like, like 30 seconds of someone handling a dog on my street, mm. if they're a responsible and aware dog owner, drives me batty and insane when people are walking around completely spaced out on their phones with their dog and they don't even realize I'm coming around the corner. I'm like, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would prefer our dogs not interact because I don't know you or your dog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so and those, greeting, those greetings can go south very, very quickly. Yeah, they really can. And I try to never approach a dog without asking the owner first. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what that dog is like. Yeah. Yeah. But so like sometimes sometimes I'll just make like a large coughing or hacking noise and then, then they'll look up from their phone like, oh, there's a dog there and they'll move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta you gotta adapt, I suppose, to the yeah, yeah. Well, though. and you have to be expecting it, you know. Sometimes like I got I got used to expecting I don't know what's on the other side of that elevator when it opens. Either. Well, and you know what? That means that actually shows that you care about the well-being of your dog. Cause some people yeah. have small dogs and they don't even care. Yeah. Oh, there was a fight. Uh, he was fine. Yeah. Oh. And they just, oh. it's another day. <laughs> oh yeah. There were, there were lots of, it was a nice big, if I loved where I lived, but there was definitely like people didn't pick up their poop and oh my gosh. Oh, I've called a couple of people. I've called in a couple of people when I catch them in their complex. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> oy, oy, oy. You're not playing around. Giardia is really big in the area. And that's what it happens. People don't pick up their poop. Then your dog sniffs it. And then they get the parasite. And then they yeah. sniff away. They can't eat. They can't drink. They're liquid diarrhea everywhere. I don't know if I can say that. But, Ugh. you know, it's really bad this year because we didn't have a, we had a very warm winter. Hmm. So it didn't yeah, kill I didn't know a lot that. of the yeah. parasite. Yeah, it didn't yeah. kill a lot of parasite. No, and I just think it's like a lack of responsibility on the owner. Absolutely. You know, if you're out hiking in the woods, like I see it, but when you're out in a public place, it just, I don't know, like you just need to be responsible. I mean, oh, and I'll, I'll I don't know. Call. I guess it's the equivalent of how I went in a public restroom and crapped on the floor. And then just left it for the next person to come in and be like, ew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I remember it is irresponsible. Um, the last person I caught doing that and not passing up poop, he had poop bags on his on his leash. Mm. But he had the dog leash in one hand and like, I don't know, some sort of alcoholic beverage in a glass in the other. Yeah. And I was I like dead deadpan stare at him in my car and he made eye contact he knew <laughs> that he did wrong <laughs> and I'm like okay I'm calling up I'm calling up Kelly she's my she's my apartment manager we're on very good terms <laughs> that's funny oh my gosh so what can we as like people take from you know like our dogs and our animals and all this stuff you and I we were talking about something a little bit more interesting because we talked about sort of the emotional side of things and what I find fascinating is that you were had been talking about the different senses and how animals not just dogs but animals in general can pick up on all these because I know your experience goes far beyond dogs as well right so you said something earlier about the senses mm -hmm. what was that like something about sensing was a bad situation or something or I don't recall I think we were talking about like I'm trying to even remember how we got into how these dogs with their different senses and how they can sense so many other things yeah because oh, maybe I think it was I know what your interpretation about. your mindset yeah so so we were talking about mindset a little bit earlier and how um, how we perceive things and how our thoughts become things. And I know you've gone on a mindset journey. Obviously, I am as well, because I think it sort of ties into all the other things like you were talking about the therapy work and, and we're all, well, at least a lot of people I think that listen to my podcast are on some kind of a self-help, self-growth journey, whether it be spiritual and the tools that I sort of introduced to people which a lot of them are more on the natural side of things and how our senses are and how we can pick up on different um like energies of other people so we were talking about dogs and it is sometimes you know when you're sad or whatever it's like your dog knows or your cat or whatever um pet or animal that you have right so to tie that in that's about the perception of the world I think that's the word yeah. you used Michelle I, th I think it was yeah I think you're right it was like how we perceive things because our thoughts then become things become things and then we're all sort of like having our own experience of per of perception and mine might be different than yours I may look at something and say oh that's like the cutest dog ever and you're like, I thought it's vicious and <laughs> never be trained. And you know what I mean? But it's all how we perceive things. Yeah. Like some people love pugs and some people do not. They, it's mm -hmm. aesthetics, right? It's all, yeah. it's all about perception and perception is interesting because a lot of it is really derived from a lot of our own personal learning history. No one person is going to have the exact same perception because we all have different histories of our own learning. Yep. But in addition to that, what we're able to perceive is also limited by our senses. Mm. Yeah. And it's and it's so interesting how all this crosses over between like the animal, the animals. 
Absolutely. Because animals have different tools that they are able to use than we do. Mm -hmm. Like birds, for example. So people, humans have three cones in their eyes that to help them see the colors and contrast with the world around them. Birds have four cones and they're able to see in the UV. Which is like, we have no idea what they're seeing. Thousands of more colors, thousands of more colors that we don't even have names for. Mm. And when we're talking about dogs as well, or dogs and cats, you know, cats have different visual perception. They can see better in the dark. Dogs have really, well, depending on the dog, not all dogs have really great noses, but in general, dogs are known for their really great noses and they can pick up on changes in our own body chemistry, like Hmm. to that level. And some dogs can alert to saying, hey, you've got more cortisol in your blood right now. Are you stressed? Let me, I smell that. Let me come over. Oh, hey, I smell that you're about to have a seizure. Let me come over, remind you, take your anti seizure meds, go mm-hmm. sit down the next five, 10, 15 minutes, and just chill out. Yeah, it's amazing what we can treat or what we can train dogs to do. I mean, just like the cadaver dogs and all these other kinds of dogs, like I think I've talked about it before, like I take my dog ratting. And there's a, a couple of them and we go to like a barn or chicken groups or whatever. And they snuff out the rat's nests in the places. And I've never even trained my dog to do it. I literally just brought her. Yeah. I brought her there Genetics, the first babe. time. And yep. she just, I just held the leash. Honestly, she did the thing and she uncovered the biggest rat's nest of the day. Wow. At that place. It was like crazy because it was the first time I had ever brought her anywhere. And I was like, oh my gosh, like it's just so innate. I don't even know if anybody trained her to do that or not. But no, she knew how no to do it's that. really cool when an animal just fits in so well for the job that they were actually bred to do. Yes. So you think yeah. about border collies. I mean, there's a lot of border collies that are not fit for herding, um, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of border collies that are. Yeah. And just to see them fit into that niche that they were literally bred for, for thousands and thousands of years, it does feel very fulfilling. Yeah. Wow. Genetics are, are so cool. And it's really no different for us because if I'm doing something that I love and it's just so natural for me, like I'm joyful and I can make a great living from it and all these things. And when I'm doing something that I wasn't really bred for and was like, thrown into my thing and I'm trudging along doing it like I'm just setting myself up for not a good time so it is so interesting when you look at how much crossover there really is yeah. and how we all kind of like are connected if you really take it out an even bigger level you're like not only we as humans are all connected but we're connected to the animals and the plants and the trees and all the other stuff in our world oh yeah no have you have you ever taken a look into evolutionary biology I have not. I've, I've so well, honestly, I've never taken any science courses that Super I wasn't cool. into. Oh my gosh! All I have to tell you, it's like real life Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Pokemon. Longer time, time for my animals ev- to evolve. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So, like one fact. So, I do have my biology degree, which is I started taking comparative vertebrate anatomy, which is anything with the spine. And one of the really cool things that I found out. I mean, along with a million other really cool things, but one that really sticks out to me is that, did you know blue whales, they actually have little vestigial legs in the back. Oh. And do you know why that is? Little is bones. That that just, are, they're there. They, they don't do anything. They're within the blubber. Are they like antenna? No, they don't no. do anything. They don't do anything. Nothing. So those are called... Those are called vestigial, um, oh, I forget the word, but it's basically a leftover body part. Oh. And they don't serve a function anymore. Hmm. And the reason why they have legs back there or little bones that used to be legs at one point is because in their evolutionary history, they did actually used to walk on land. Huh. Whales um used to walk on land and um at one point and we have the whole evolutionary line and history leading to it um of how they started to develop flippers and 
um, you know, within the right chunks of time over different years. So if, if that's something you're interested in looking into, I highly suggest looking into the history of whale evolution because uh, it is really, really fascinating. Yeah, and they're really interesting animals just as they are. There's so much we don't know about them, I'm sure, to this day. Well, and it makes sense because they don't have gills. They are mammals. They were once yeah. land mammals and they do still need to survive on oxygen and they need to come up for oxygen and air. Yeah. And once you have lungs, you can't get rid of those lungs. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's so interesting, all the stuff that like we don't know that we just sort of have to piece together, you know, and I'm sure there's many philosophies on everything. It's just so interesting to me. Mm hmm. Yep, that was one of my coolest. It's like real life Pokemon. That's that's all how I can explain it. You know, <laughs> being, being a '90s kid, I was big into my Pokemon. So uh, my kids were too. I don't. Well, they weren't in the '90s, but I remember my son. My son and my nephew always play Pokemon when we go to the beach. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, the next time you're at the beach, you can point out the whale you see and be like, "Look, yeah. it's Pokemon." And I we do, I have done that. I've gone on whale watch um tours and dolphin watching tours and finding them it's pretty interesting that's awesome Love and it. they usually kind of like it you can tell that the animals are it's almost like as if they aren't really doing a show they're not scrambling away that's well, for sure yeah i i um i had worked at the florida aquarium for a period of time and they did dolphin tours mm. i never saw any dolphins on the tours but the stories that i would huh. hear of the people going on the tour it was usually they would come check the boat out. They might, you know, do some breaching in the water for a little bit. Um, they might hang around with you for a little while and then they'll go off and go back and do their own thing, you know? Yeah. It is, it's, I don't know. I find the dolphins pretty cool. I love when I go to the beach always to try to scan the horizon for them. <laughs> and then we all get dorkishly excited. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, well. Well, what can we as people take um, as lessons from our fellow dogs and cats and birds that we can put into our daily lives to help us grow as people? Ooh, yeah. I, I know I landed you a loaded question. No, that's a good, that's a good one though. I think to kind of tie it together with the perception is that keep into consideration that every person, every animal, every creature is an individual in some way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. and try to see the world from their viewpoint. Don't push your viewpoint and be so desperate to push your viewpoint for other people to always see your point of view. Mm -hmm. Life is a give and take. Yeah. It's back and forth. It's not dominated. You don't have this alpha wolf trying to dominate you. That's uh, alpha pack theory has been debunked many, many, many times. Um, and even by the original researcher who proposed it, you can watch hmm. this video on YouTube. It's actually a family group and families survive and they function on good communication, on love, kindness, and caring hmm. and on mutual understanding. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And that's, I guess, how we all could be better humans. <laughs> Absolutely. Learn from the wolves. It's a, it's a, it's a family affair. Uh, it is. And I am firmly believe that we were not meant to be put here by ourselves. We were all meant to, you know, meant to have relationships with one another. I mean, I guess the clearest form of that is that we can't even make any more of ourselves without having a relationship. <laughs> so know, right? that, it'd be so much easier it. if we could just ace actually reproduce and like bud a little person from our head and yeah, be like, that'd oh. be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it'd be fun. It seems kind of painful, but <laughs> it does. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't seem what us humans, but but definitely I know that we as human beings were here to create, and that is how I got to meet you, and we get together about once a month and, you know, talk about all the things going on because we do, you know, we were meant to be, we're social creatures by nature to a certain extent. Absolutely. We need our alone time and all that other stuff, but yeah, but ultimately we're here to communicate and learn and, and socialize with one another. And I think that what's for me, that's what makes life so much more fun. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> life should be experienced for sure.
It should. Well, where can people get in touch with you? I know you have a website and you do if you are in the area or have questions or however people can reach out to you. Yes. So my program is Lehigh Valley Service Dogs. If you're looking to find me online, I am on all the platforms under the handle at Caitlin's Animals. Uh, Caitlin is C-A-I-T-L-I-N. There is no Y and then an S for Caitlin's and then just animals after that. Um, so my big platforms are Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and sometimes YouTube. I'm kind of sporadic with videos on there. And then of course, my main website is caitlinsanimals.com where you can learn more about the programs of what I offer and how I help people and their dogs to thrive together. Well, if you are looking for a service dog in need of a service dog, or if you're in the area and you just want better help training your dog, she also does training in the park for four to six weeks, I think you said. Correct. So yes. I do have a group program as well as private in-home coaching. Um, the group program, it's more of a dog gym type subscription. So uh, it's $100 a month. So, and you get two sessions every week to train with your dog because a lot of people I find need that extra time. Mm -hmm. It might be hard to find time at home or to work into the routine. So if you're looking for getting a lot of work done with your dog within an hour, um, we do those um, memberships as well. And you're virtual, right? I am virtual. Yes, so you do not have virtual. to live in Pennsylvania. Good news. Absolutely. Yeah, I do offer, I do have a couple online clients for service dog coaching. That tends to be my most popular since not every area has their own service dog coach. It tends yeah. to be highly specialized. And then I do also offer some virtual work for if you have a new puppy um, I have a great reference. I can, I'm no longer taking on separation anxiety cases, not my jam, <laughs> but I do have a good reference. If you have a dog with uh, separation anxiety that you would like to work virtually. And I know there's people out there with it. My sister's dog is one of them. <laughs> well, I can give her a great reference. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, Caitlin, so much for spending all this time with me today. I really appreciate you and all that you're doing for service dogs and for people as well thank you so much for having me on michelle i really oh, appreciate you're, it. you're absolutely welcome we'll have to have you back and maybe delve into more of the mindset stuff or maybe whatever else is new that you can bring to us but in the meantime go check her out everything will be in the description and until next time thank you for watching the wealth within us